Where will the toilet of the future come from? When will it arrive, and what is it going to look like? For an answer to this question, I looked at the Earth's brightest minds, people working in exploration of Antarctica, space, and Mars. First, Antarctica. As you can imagine, it's very cold there. And there are about 60 research stations from all over the world working and doing research in Antarctica. And I asked the obvious question, how do they go to the bathroom? <laughs> so first, to get water, they dig a deep well from which they melt water. And then once they have a well big enough, they get all the wastewater, including poop, and they discharge in these ice pits in Antarctica. So not much to learn there. How about in space? NASA has a $23.4 million toilet. It separately collects urine and feces. The urine gets recycled along with astronauts' tears and sweat, and they get to drink all of that. So I thought that was promising. How about astronaut poop? What happens to it? Well, it gets dehydrated and compacted and stuffed into a space trash can. It's called Progress, and the Russians built it. So once Progress is full of trash and astronaut poop, it's fired towards Earth. And as it enters our atmosphere, it catches fire, and it burns like a shooting star. <laughs> That's progress. <laughs> so next time we see a shooting star, let's all make a wish for a better space toilet. <laughs> and how about Mars? Back in September, I got to ask Elon Musk, one of the main forces behind Mars exploration, if his company is working on a toilet for Mars. CNN called my question bizarre, and a lot of people called me stupid. I mean, who asks Elon Musk if he's working on a toilet? <laughs> the same person who read the NASA technology roadmaps, technology area number six, section 1.3.1, which says that NASA is looking for a better space toilet. And to get to Mars, we're going to have to develop one by 2021. And if we're going to be self-sustaining in Mars, we're going to have to figure out a better toilet. But what's wrong with our toilets? Why can't we just bring our toilets from Earth to space? The fact is that it's not only space toilets that need to be improved. It's this, the toilet that you and I use today including in this very same building. To learn a little bit more about the shortcomings of our toilet, I want to share with you four experiences that happened to me this summer. The first is the Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. And I'm not sure if you guys remember, but the whole world found out that the waters of Guanabara Bay was contaminated with sewage and that any athlete that swim in there risked getting sick. I wonder how many of you know about a triathlon that happened in Washington, D.C. Shortly after that, there's a river called Potomac River in the nation's capital, right by the White House. And this triathlon competition swimming portion was canceled for the same reasons as Rio de Janeiro. That is too much fecal matter in the river. After that, I was in Miami and, uh, for a weekend, and there was a health warning advisory against swimming in the waters of South Beach for the same reasons, too much sewage in the beach. And earlier this summer, I was here in Cancun, and I swam from Cancun to Isla Mujeres, and even though I was in the water for hours, I saw no major wildlife or coral life. 
So why is there so much sewage in all of our waters, no matter where you are, rich or poor countries? To learn a little bit about that, we need to understand where our modern sanitation system came from. And it all, we have to thank London and the Industrial Revolution, because that's when a lot of people moved in from the countryside into the city of London. And back then, in the 1850s, there were a lot of cholera, typhoid, dysentery, and hepatitis outbreaks. Because when the wash closet came together, people didn't know what to do with all the waste water. So they just did septic tanks. But then, since a lot of people started getting sick, the city leaders had the brilliant and expeditious idea of channeling all the wastewater into the Thames River, and that's how our modern sanitation system was born. In fact, sewage comes from sea ward or towards the sea. So the fact that today, in most cities around the world, we have sewage in our rivers is no accident. It's by design. But one of the most harmful shortcomings of our modern sanitation system is that it wastes a lot of water. The bathroom in your house is the single largest user of water in your household, as much as 30%. Since the 1850s, we haven't really improved sanitation. We have lacked innovation in this area because we stopped thinking about it. And I think the worst side effect of our lack of innovation in this area is the fact that one-third of the world's population lacks access to sanitation. Three billion people. Just look at the two people next to you, and you are the one without a toilet. How would you go about your day? And I was very unsatisfied with this modern sanitation system because I want everyone in the whole world to have a toilet. And a water flushing toilet cannot be the answer to this question. So I wanted to see what happened before 1850. How did we manage sanitation before then? Could we learn from history? And I was very happy to find two great examples. One right here in Mexico. If you recognize, that is the Valley of Central Mexico during the 16th century. That's Mexico Tenochtitlan. And when the Aztecs first came to the valley, they had to constantly fight water. First, because it was always flooding their land, and second, because brackish water was mixing with fresh water. So the Aztecs built these aqueducts, which also worked as dikes and their causeways. If you look in the middle of the of the picture, that's Mexico to Nochitlan, but in the beginning, it was just a couple of little islands in these shallow lakes. And so the Aztecs had the ingenious idea of building chinampas, which was a technology in which they staked out piles into the sh uh, la shallow lake bed, and um, they would backfill it with mud and aquatic plants. And that's how they raised themselves above the water level. When the Europeans arrived, they were mesmerized at Tenochtitlan and how clean it was and how fertile the land was. And the chinampas were also do, used for plantations. In Xochimilco, they are there to this day. And so what did the bathrooms of the Aztecs look like? First, they were very clean. They had temascales and steam baths twice a day, but they didn't have private bathrooms there were instead community restrooms in each of the canals. And what they would do, they would separately collect urine and feces, just like in the space station. The urine had many uses, like tanning hides. The feces were collected also in pottery and mixed with limestone or firewood ash. Once the pots were filled, they would then be taken by canoes to the farmlands where they would be used as manure. That's right. The Aztecs used human manure to fertilize their fields. But they weren't the only ones. If you look throughout history, the Romans have done it in, through their cloaca maxima, and in Asia, the Chinese have also done it through night soil. What the Aztecs knew, and what we have forgotten, 
is that there is this thing called the nutrient cycle. In nature, there's no such thing as waste. Every time that we harvest plants from the soil, we're removing precious nutrients. And the only way to restore fertility is through manure. The Aztecs didn't have any cows, so they just used human manure. And the reason that they have been able to do that, and we can also still do that today, is because human manure is a precious ingredient. If we look at it from a first principles perspective, from a scientific point of view, we're going to realize that urine is 95% water. Urine also has ammonia from which we can get nitrogen. It also has potassium and phosphate. Human manure, the solids, also has 75% water and then nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate. That those are very incredibly rich nutrients, and if you go into your local hardware store, you're going to buy fertilizer that has exactly those same ingredients. Another example that I found was from my home country, Brazil. And um, there were also many successfully uh, civilizations in the Amazons back before Europeans arrived with hundreds of thousands of members. And the way that they managed all the waste, including organic, animal, and vegetable waste, was through this practice called biological charcoal, or biochar. You can produce biochar through these mounds, or also you can do a barbacoa-style cooking under the earth. <laughs> and biochar is produced like this. You get all the wastes, and then you put in these stoves, and the secret is to have an oxygen-starved environment, at which point you have a pyrolysis. Pyrolysis means that when you're cooking in organic matter, you have an evaporation of gases, and what remains is this charcoal-like substance, which is full, which is rich in carbon. So given the physical and the chemical characteristics of the charcoal, when you mix it with the soil, you then get water retention, nutrient retention, and also the bacteria that are inherently in the soil, they congregate near the biochar, and then they help the plants obtain all the nutrients from the soil, kind of like the bacteria in our stomachs also help us obtain nutrients from our food. So back then, we knew all of this. We were sustainable. We had no other choice. This is Dr. Von Herzen from the Climate Foundation. He has done a biochar reactor that we can use to produce biochar from human manure. I've used his paper to present a toilet prototype for Mars, and my paper was one of 25 selected around the world. And if Elon Musk is listening, I'd like to propose that we're going to give you this free of charge. <laughs> the good thing about using biochar for Mars is that we can use the same design here on Earth for the three billion people who today don't have sanitation or a toilet. One of the things that makes me really sad about sanitation is that 1.2 million children under the age of five die every year needlessly just because they don't have access to sanitation. And it's not their fault. It's not like they have to be developed and civilized like us so that one day they can also poop in their waters. It's up to us to change the concept of sanitation. So, with all this said, what will the toilet of the future look like? First of all, it's going to be waterless. Water is too precious of a resource for us to contaminate just to transport human waste. Instead, we're going to use vacuum suction. The toilet of the future won't be thought of as a disposal device. Instead, it's going to be used to collect precious nutrients. We won't treat human waste. Instead, we're going to enrich human manure. The toilet of the future won't be exclusive. 
so that only a couple of us can use it. Instead, it's going to be universal. The toilet of the future is not going to be polluting or wasteful. It's going to be sustainable. But what makes me the happiest about the toilet of the future is that we don't have to wish upon a shooting star. <laughs> we don't have to wait for a technological miracle from NASA. Because if we learn the lessons of our ancestors, and if we combine them with current technology, then the toilet of the future already exists. Thank you. <laughs>